Hi, everyone. Welcome to Conveyor Meetup. Today we have Phil Ginn, who will be presenting to us on app modernization patterns. Um, so we're super excited to have him here, mostly because this is a topic we usually get a lot of questions around. So we won't be going into any of the tools that are within the Conveyor community today. Um, it's really more about the actual approach to app modernization patterns. Um, I do want to go over some a couple of housekeeping items before I hand it over to him. So first of all, if you have any questions, please put in the Q&A. I'll get to them uh, likely at the end. However, if I see a good stopping point, I'll, I'll ask Bill again. And second of all, I will send out the slides and the recording to this probably two days after this meetup. Bill again, it's all yours. Thanks. Thanks, Jonathan. Let me stop sharing my screen. You can see my screen well. Yes, you're good to go. Awesome. Hello, everybody, and thanks for joining me uh, in this session from your screens, uh, and thanks for inviting me to the Conveyor Community Meetup. Um, I want to start uh, uh, my talk with a quote from uh, Ellen Ullman, a quote from the 90s, where she says, we built our computers the way we built our cities, over time, uh, without a plan, on top of ruins. And I believe that quote applies also to the way we build modern software today. And that is over time, you know, projects take long time. We have short term goals and priorities and we have to build very often on top of existing legacy uh, systems. So in this talk, I will go over a few patterns and tools I have seen uh, working for application modernization and, and migration. And that is specifically for migrating applications into event-driven applications that use uh, Kubernetes at the foundation, Apache Kafka for messaging, uh, and Debezium for change data capture. So my, my name is Vilgini Bram. Yeah, I'm a product manager at Red Hat. Before that, I have been consultant and architect for many years using Red Hat middleware on customer projects and helping with uh, migration and modernization initiatives. In my current role, I'm involved with uh, Apache Kafka, which is a messaging uh, layer, um, Apicurio, which is a schema registry uh, and API uh, registry, uh, Debezium for change data capture, and all of these uh, projects and experiences have influenced me on what I put uh, in this talk. So let's get started first by defining what we're going to cover in this talk. Uh, application modernization is a very broad topic, and generally uh, it refers to the process of taking an existing legacy application and modernizing its infrastructure or internal architecture, I would say. And typically that is for improving the feature velocity. That's the most requested feature more recently, but it can also uh, be for improving performance, scalability, you know, exposing the existing functionality to new use cases and so forth. And luckily for us, I would say there is already a very good classification of modernization and uh, migration terminology. And depending on your needs and appetite for a change, there are a few levels of modernization. And at the very bottom of the ladder, I would uh, put what uh, is called retain. And that means ig ignore any modernization needs and um, maybe these needs are not pressing enough and just keep using uh, the existing software. The next thing would be to retire the software and get rid of it completely. That might be possible if you discover that the application is actually not used by anybody. But more realistically, the chances are you will have to rehost, replatform, or uh, uh, refactor. Uh, so the next thing in the ladder is uh, rehosting, which typically means taking the application as it is uh, and hosting it on a new infrastructure such as a cloud infrastructure or even uh, taking your VM and hosting it on Kubernetes with something like KubeVirt. And that's not a, a, a bad option actually if you have an application that cannot be containerized but you still want to reuse your in-house Kubernetes skills and manage uh, a VM as if it was a container. So and benefit from the same uh, abstractions for storage, networking, and so forth. Um, the next level uh, on this ladder is replatforming, and that's the option when changing the infrastructure is not giving you enough benefits, and 
you are looking for changes maybe at the edges of the application uh, without changing its you know, internal architecture. So that can be changing the way the application is um, configured so that it can be containerized the way it's using its external dependency or even changing its runtime. Maybe you're moving from a legacy Java E runtime to more uh, uh, newer version of Java E. And here, what I've seen is there are tools such as uh, WindUp, which is an upstream open source project that can be very useful for analyzing your application and producing reports, uh, which tells you what needs to be done to move from one source uh, platform to, uh, to a target one. But much of the application modernization uh, topic today is um, from what I see is focused around migrating monolithic on-premise applications to cloud native microservices, uh, uh, which enable faster release cycles. And that involves refactoring and re-architecting the application completely. So in this talk, we will look into a few patterns and tools uh, for this particular uh, uh, way of uh, modernization. For the purpose of this talk, uh, I assume we are working with a monolithic on-premise application, which is a common starting point. And the, the same can be also applied if you're doing a cloud migration initiative, for example. And some of the common challenges with, um, with this kind of monolithic legacy applications are around the deployment frequency or scaling the development to more developers or even uh, to multiple development teams that have to work on a common code base. Um, scaling the application can be uh, an, another reason to scaling it to handle increased uh, load. And the, some of the expected benefits from such modernizations are typically such as uh, reduced time to market, uh, increased team autonomy, uh, dynamic scaling to handle a lot more efficiently, and so forth. So these are kind of common themes uh, around modernization. Uh, for, again, for this talk, what's the target state? I would say the target state here, what I have in mind is an um, architectural style that is heavily influenced by microservices principles and open source technologies, Kubernetes, Kafka, and Divisio. Uh, when I say microservices principles, I mean services that are deployed independently. They're modeled around business domain. They own their own data. They emit their own events uh, and so forth. And when we do modernization, it's also important to measure um, the outcomes, the result of, the, uh, of this effort. And that can be through some metrics such as uh, lead time for a change. So how long it takes uh, from the time a change is, a bug is fixed, let's say the time it reaches the customer or how many times per day I can deploy the deployment frequency, time to recovery or concurrent users your system can handle. So uh, you, you should have some kind of uh, metrics you see improving as part of the modernization. Uh, so let's start our journey. Uh, the most uh, popular uh, technique that is used today for application migration is the Strangler pattern. And it's made popular by, I'll say Martin Fowler. And it's uh, made popular by the name uh, Strangler Fig application and it's inspired by a type of uh, thick tree that sits itself at the upper branches of trees and gradually evolves around the original tree, uh, eventually completely replacing it. And the parallel with application migration modernization is that our new service is essentially uh, set up to wrap around the existing system and it's supposed to exist with the old system. And that gives the new system time to grow and potentially replace the old system. One, some of the key benefits of these patterns is that it allows low risk incremental replacement of a whole of the le legacy system with a new one. Moreover, it allows us to stop uh, the migration and even return back to the old system if, uh, if needed. So let, let's look at some of the uh, steps that are involved in this uh, pattern. Uh, the very first question, uh, is where do we start our migration? And here we can use domain-driven design, which will help us to identify things such as aggregates in the legacy system or bounded context that can then each represent a potential unit for the commissioning and a potential boundary for the microservice. Or we can go a step further and use techniques such as event storming. Uh, uh, this technique is created by Antonio Brandolini and it's a collaborative uh, exercise that involves 
uh, technical stakeholders, non-technical stakeholders who get to uh, discover and get the shared understanding of the domain model uh, of an application or a business. And uh, it's important to point out that this technique has nothing to do with event-driven architecture. It's called event storming, but it's purely for discovering the domain model and getting to shared understanding. Um, so once we have this understanding, another important consideration here would be how are the models uh, interacting with the database and what would be the effort to decommission uh, or decompose uh, the, uh, the database. Well, once we have such a list of models and uh, the next thing we would do is maybe identify the relationship between the dependencies to get an idea of the relative difficulty for, uh, for each model. Now, armed with this information, um, we can proceed. Do we want to have an easy win uh, and pick a model that has least amount of dependencies? Or do we want to start with the most difficult one that maybe that's at the core of the system has and has most of the dependencies? And I, I would say here a good compromise would be to pick a service that is uh, uh, representative of most of the other services in your legacy application, and that can help you identify which are some of the common uh, external dependencies, such as uh, databases, file systems, and other things that you need to put in place before you can start uh, 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 migrating the application. And it also then can help you serve as a uh, as a base for estimating the re the rest of the migration effort. Uh, so for the strangler pattern to work, uh, that is a clear prerequisite, and that is being able to clearly map the inbound calls uh, uh, to the functionality that we want to uh, uh, extract. And not only map, but we want to also to redirect these calls to the new service and back if needed. And depending on the state of the legacy application, the consuming client applications, uh, this may be a straightforward activity or a difficult one. For example, the easiest option would be if you can change the client application and redirect it to use your new service. But if that's not possible, then you have to do something within your legacy application. And uh, it might be that you are using HTTP, and that's also a good start because the HTTP is uh, very amendable for redirection, and there are lots of HTTP proxy options available. But the chances are your legacy application won't be exposing, you know, REST APIs uh, over HTTP, and most likely you may have something like SOAP and RPC, FTP, or some kind of traditional messaging endpoints. And uh, in this case, you may need to build a custom protocol uh, translation layer with something like uh, Apache uh, Camel. So what is uh, Apache Camel? I'd say in one slide, if I have to summarize it, it is an integration toolkit uh, which has hundreds of uh, connectors. And the chances are whatever is your legacy application, it doesn't matter what kind of uh, API or protocol it exposes, the chances are Camel will have a connector for it. So most likely that, that's the case. So you can use Camel connectors uh, uh, for co connecting, the, uh, for intercepting the external calls to your legacy application. And uh, in addition to connectors, Camel also has uh, implementations of integration patterns, which are standardized integration patterns based on the book you see on the screen. So these integration patterns can help you then to decide which incoming calls you want to intercept, which one you want to call you want to filter out and which one you want to let in. You want you can use a pattern such as content-based router. So based on the request, you can decide whether you want to forward it that to the new implementation of the service or to the legacy application. Not only that, you could use another pattern called multicast and send the request to both uh, systems if this is what you want to do. So that's uh, Camel briefly. Uh, so uh, if we implement uh, our uh, we, we could implement our proxy in Camel, but that also leaves there is a, a potential um, dangerous uh, slope here, and that is if we start building lots of uh, custom protocol translation layers, uh, layer that is shared by multiple services, that in, in turn turns to common dependency, and that is uh, misaligned with the dump pipes mantra that microservices principle uh, follow. 
so an option here would be to use a sidecar pattern, which is another pattern. Um, to explain sidecar, let's briefly have a look into Kubernetes and Kubernetes pods. So a pod in Kubernetes is the, is the application uh, management and deployment abstraction. So when you deploy an application into Kubernetes, uh, you deploy them in the form of pods, which are a collection of containers, uh, one or more. And a pod gives uh, uh, certain guarantees to these containers. For example, it gives deployment guarantees, uh, which means all containers in the pod get deployed to the same uh, post, to the same node. Uh, another type of guarantee, I would say, is the lifecycle guarantees. So depending on uh, how the containers are grouped, containers can be init containers, where they're executed one after another. So when a container finishes and it's shut down, the next one starts, that's the init container. Or a container can be application container, where the containers run together side by side. And when you have more than one containers running side by side and they're collaborating, that's basically the sidecar pattern. So sidecar pattern in uh, summary is a way to extend and enhance uh, the functionality of a pre-existing container uh, without changing it through another container. You just combine containers together. Uh, and if you are more interested more into Kubernetes uh, patterns, sidecar patterns and others, can go to the link uh, on the slide, which is kidspatterns.io, and get a free copy uh, of my book that covers these patterns. So, uh, so back to our uh, strangler pattern. So the idea here is that uh, rather than having this custom proxy uh, logic, uh, rather than having it as a shared layer, uh, make it part of each service. But rather than embedding the shared proxy, uh, the custom proxy into the service, uh, at compile time, we use the Kubernetes sidecar pattern and make this a runtime binding activity. Uh, with that pattern uh, in place, the protocol translation proxy is used uh, for the legacy clients and, and the new service API is offered for the new clients. Inside the proxy, calls get translated and redirected to the new API. So that allows the reuse of the proxy if you need that, but more importantly, it can uh, enable easily decommissioning of the proxy, removing it from the application when it's no longer needed by the legacy clients and have a minimal impact on your on your service. So th this would be uh, uh, another way to combine, you know, sidecar pattern with the strangler pattern for a specific uh, uh, use case. So once we have um, identified the functional boundaries, uh, and the interception method. Next is the database strangulation. And there, I would say uh, broadly, there are the following paths to choose from. Uh, we can start with the database first, uh, where we separate the schema first, but uh, the chances are this will likely impact the legacy application. For example, in the legacy application, you may have selects now that have to pull queries from two databases, or you may have update operations that need distributed transaction because they need to write to two databases. So this option actually requires changes to the source uh, application and it also doesn't help with showing and demonstrating progress uh, in the initial phases uh, of the project. So that's not something uh, we are looking for. Uh, the, the other approach would be to start with the code first, which means uh, we are um, implementing our service uh, uh, separately, uh, quickly, and we are uh, reusing the legacy database. Uh, but uh, th there is also a potential uh, trouble here because this approach can give us a false sense of progress because it may turn out later that uh, uh, splitting the database is a lot of effort. Um, but it's, I would say this is, a, again, an approach that's in the right direction and it can help you, you know, show progress quickly and it can uh, help you discover what are the data ownerships within the monolithic database and what needs to be done. And the third approach is where we separate the code and the database together in one go. And this can be a, a difficult to aim for from the get-go, but it's, uh, it, it's, ultimately where you want to end up. Uh, and regardless of the path you take, the approach, the approach you start, uh, ultimately you want to end up with a separate service with its own database. Uh, that, that's the end goal. 
Mm. So having a separate database then leads to a data synchronization needs. And again, there are a few uh, technological approaches uh, in this case you can choose from. The first one is with triggers. Um, and most databases allow you to execute some custom behavior when data is changing, data is changed. And in some cases that can even be uh, calling a web service and integrating with uh, other system, but how triggers are implemented and what you can do with them uh, varies from database to database. And they are very database specific, not portable. Okay. Um, uh, I would say another limitation here is that this uh, triggers requires you to do some changes in the late legacy database, which you might be reluctant to do so. So the, 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 this makes the whole approach of using triggers not very appealing. Um, the other approach is to use queries, um, which basically means have an external system that regularly checks the source database for changes, and the changes can be detected with implementations such as uh, timestamps on the columns or version numbers or uh, status indicators. But regardless of the implementation strategy, the polling always has this dilemma whether you should uh, poll very often, which can uh, have some overhead on the source database or poll uh, less often, but then you may uh, miss some frequent updates. Also, you don't have the option to capture any deletes that are happening. So this is an easy to install and configure, but has a significant limitations for the like, critical applications uh, with lots of uh, interactions. Um, and the last option listed here is the uh, log reader approach, uh, which basically identifies changes um, by scanning the database transaction log files. And these log files exist for database backup and recovery purposes, and they, they actually provide a reliable way to capture all changes, uh, including deletes. So log readers is the least disrupt uh, disruptive option because it doesn't require any modifications to the source database. You don't have to install triggers or anything, and it doesn't require any changes to the uh, application. You don't have to add any columns so that you can query it. You know, the main downside here is that there is no common standard for the transaction log files, and you need specialized tools to understand these log files and process. And this is projects. Uh, uh, this is why projects such as um, Visium uh, exist. Uh, what is the Visium? Again, in one slide, uh, let's cover what's that. Um, uh, so when um, an application writes to a database. Uh, the data, uh, the changes first get written to log files, and then actually tables are updated. And different databases have different log files. You know, MySQL has bin files, bin log. Postgres has write ahead log. MongoDB has ops log. Uh, and the good news is that the Bizium has uh, connectors for all of these databases, and it ha it does the hard work to understand the the actual format uh, of these log files, uh, read the log files, and then produce a generic abstract event. It produced these events typically into uh, uh, Kafka. Uh, and today, Dibizium is probably the most widely used open source uh, change data capture project uh, with uh, multiple connectors. And uh, it's a great fit for the Strangler uh, pattern. Now, one thing that might not be clear from this diagram is that Dibizium is uh, aware of the source changes and emits those into Kafka, uh, but the Visium actually doesn't uh, does uh, the writing into to the other database from Kafka. So to getting uh, for getting data from Kafka and writing to another database or to some other reporting analytic tools, you have you you will need to use something like again Apache Camel or Kafka Connect connectors. Mm. So why Dibizium is a good fit uh, for the Strangler pattern? I think there are some uh, specific Dibizium features which I think makes it a really good fit. So one, uh, 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 so um, le le let's see those. So the first one I'll say is uh, snapshotting. Uh, so snapshotting allows Dibizium to take a snapshot of the current state of the source database. Uh, 
which can be used for bulk importing into the uh, new database. And once snapshotting is completed, the BGM also starts uh, streaming changes uh, uh, to keep the target database in sync with, with any, any changes that are happening. Another feature is filtering. Uh, so uh, when we are doing, um, uh, when we are applying the strangler pattern, we are not migrating the whole application at once. We are peeling off uh, pieces of it. Uh, so we don't need to replicate the whole database. And filtering allows us to pick a specific database, tables, and columns, and only stream changes from those. Um, and, and this is kind of aligned with the strangler pattern. Um, I would say another thing is uh, something called simple message transformation, uh, SMTs. And the uh, SMTs can act as an anti-corruption layer and protect your new database, new data model from legacy uh, naming and data formats. So it can do transformation of, uh, of the data uh, on, on the fly. Um, another feature I can call here is integration with uh, schema registry. Uh, it can play a similar role and act as an anti-corruption layer. So you can use a schema registry uh, such as Epicurio with Debezium for schema validation and, and, and enforce certain uh, version compatibility checks when the source database changes. So if the source database removes a column, that might not be compatible with what the downstream systems are expecting, and that will stop the Bizium for publishing these changes into Kafka until you fix that, maybe with the SMT where you add the default value and make the change uh, uh, backward uh, uh, compatible. And I would say there are reasons why using the Bizium with Kafka uh, are good fit for application migration and the strangle pattern in general, but we won't go into these details things such as guaranteed ordering of data changes, uh, message compaction, ability to reread the changes as many times as needed. Uh, you know, downstream systems, they can read the data from Kafka as many times they need, they can drop the data and read it again, etc. cetera, uh, are all among those uh, reasons. So with that, uh, Quick overview of the Bizium. Let's see where we are with the strangle pattern. So what we have done so far is we, we've discussed, we've, uh, we've identified the functional boundary. Uh, we, we migrated the functionality to our cool new uh, framework, you know, maybe something like Spring Boot or even better Corcus. Then we deployed the service, let's say onto Kubernetes environment. We migrated the database model into some kind of cloud database. Uh, and we migrated the data with the Bizium and we kept the Bizium running to synchronize any ongoing changes from the legacy system to our new database. And at this point, there is still no traffic routed to our new service yet. Um, we are at the point of releasing the new service and depending on the capabilities of our routing layer, we can use techniques such as start launching, parallel runs, canary releasing, that can de-risk the rollout of this new service. Uh, what we can also do is, here initially we could direct only read requests to our new service, and we still let the writes go to the legacy system. Uh, in the diagram, actually that is required because we are replicating changes only in a single direction, from the legacy to the new database, using the Bizium, Kafka, and things like uh, that. Mm. And if the reads are going through fine and there are no issues, then we can also direct the write traffic to the new service. Uh, at this point, if we still need the legacy application to operate for whatever reason, we will need to stream changes uh, from the new service toward the legacy application. And that's something we could do again with the Bizium, and there are good reasons for doing that, we will see later. Now, it's important to note here that we cannot have writes go uh, going on both directions for the same uh, tables. Uh, in the diagram, the writes go to the legacy application, but that's for the rest of the legacy application. Next, we want to stop any writes that are going to the uh, uh, legacy module, and we, we're stopping also the, uh, the replication of data from the legacy to the new one. Since we are still uh, have legacy read operations in place, we now 
uh, are replicating from the new database uh, to the old one. Uh, and eventually, we stop all um, operations in the legacy module and we stop data replication in all directions. And at this point, the migrated module is ready for the commissioning in the legacy. So that this could be one way of uh, uh, the, uh, migrating an application from legacy one and managing the traffic and data. Oh, so this was a broad, quick look into the Strangler approach, um, but we are not done with the modernization yet. But say, let's see some of the other challenges that come later after the modernization process has started and see how again, same tool set can help uh, with these challenges. Um, so the most important reason, in my view, for considering the strangle pattern is the reduced risk. Um, it gives us value steadily, you know, it allows us to demonstrate progress with the frequent releases, but migration alone without uh, enhancements or new business value can be hard sell for all stakeholders. And when we want to migrate, uh, we are also uh, usually tasks uh, to enhance the services and add brand new services uh, uh, throughout the modernization process. You know, with the modernization initiatives, actually, we are very often asked uh, to also set the foundation and the best practices uh, for building modern applications that will follow the modernization process. Um, uh, by migrating more and more services, you know, by peeling off these services from the legacy ap uh, application uh, and in general by transitioning towards the microservices architecture, there are new challenges that come up, challenges that uh, you may have not uh, uh, experienced before. Uh, and these are things such as automation, the deployment uh, and operating large number of services, uh, performing dual rights or orchestrating long running business uh, transactions. Um, there will be new users who, who are now going to ask you for uh, uh, for data, for analytical and reporting needs. Since you have now a new modern application, you should be able to provide the, this data. And these are all examples of challenges that might not have existed in the legacy world. So let's explore how the same toolset can help with some of these. Uh, so while we are peeling off, you know, this uh, uh, services, more and more services, uh, and we are creating brand new services to satisfy new business requirements, it becomes uh, very quickly apparent that we need automated deployments, uh, rollbacks, placements, configuration management, you know, upgrades, self-healing, and so on. And these are the exact features that Kubernetes uh, is a great fit uh, for when it comes down to operating large scale microservices. So that's why I would say we need Kubernetes in the picture. And not only that, when we are working with event driven services, there's also a need to automate the eventing uh, infrastructure. That is Apache Kafka, but not only Apache Kafka, there are also other projects that surround Apache Kafka that you will need to uh, automate. Kubernetes also offers operators that uh, can help you automate uh, of, uh, Kafka and these supporting services. For example, the StreamZ project uh, offers operators for automating the management of Kafka and Kafka Connect. A Keda project offers uh, operators for workload uh, autoscalers, which means it's, it is scaling your application depending on, on the lag uh, in the Kafka topics. Uh, so if your application is lagging behind, it will scale your application up uh, uh, up to the replication uh, up to the number of top, uh, uh, partitions in that topic. Uh, you can use things such as Knative Eventing, or you can use Apicurio, which provides a schema registry, and also it has uh, operators for running schema registry on Kubernetes. So Kubernetes not only is a target platform for your application, but it can also act as a target platform for your eventing infrastructure and integrate uh, both. Uh, so let's see uh, two more patterns before we finish off uh, this talk. So once you build a couple of um, microservices, you quickly realize that the hardest part about them is data. And as part of their business logic, microservices often have to update their local data store 
and at the same time they also have to send a notification to other services about the changes that just happened and this is uh, a challenge that's not so obvious in the world of monolithic applications or in the world where we have distributed transactions with uh, two-phase commit you know uh, there are different approaches for letting the other service know about the changes just happened for example we could do rest or grpc call uh, but this creates some uh, undesired coupling uh, for example to send a request the other service has to be uh, uh, available we have to know where to send the request and discover the other uh, service so how can this um, situation be avoided and solve the cloud native way i would say the answer is to only modify one of the two uh, resources and that's the database the local database and drive the updates to the second data source to other services through apache kafka in an eventually consistent matter, uh, manner. And the outbox pattern describes an approach for letting services execute this kind of tasks in a safe and a consistent uh, manner. So instead of directly sending a message to Kafka while updating the database, the service uh, uses a single local transaction to perform both a normal update that it would do as part of its business logic and also insert a message in the same database uh, in an outbox table. And so that only requires one write to its local database with a local transaction. And once the transaction has been written, the database transaction log is read by Divisium and sent to Apache Kafka. Now, this gives us some nice properties um, by synchronously writing to the database in a single transaction, you get uh, read on or you write semantics. That means any request that comes to the same a service can find the data that's been just written uh, and at the same time we get an asynchronous propagation of data to other services uh, with Apache Kafka and in my view this is a it's a proven approach for avoiding dual rights and creating scalable event-driven uh, microservices and it solves this inter-service communication challenge very elegantly you know without requiring all the participants to be available at the same time, including Kafka. So even, uh, even if Kafka is not available or other services are not available, you will uh, stop and wait where it's left off uh, reading the uh, log files. Now, while the outbox uh, pattern solves this simpler inter-service communication uh, problem, it's, uh, it's not sufficient alone for, serving, uh, for solving the more complex long-running distributed business transactions use case and for the latter uh, we need executing uh, uh, multiple operations across multiple microservices and applying consistent all or nothing semantics and a common uh, example for demonstrating this uh, this requirement is booking a trip use case which constitutes of multiple parts where uh, let's say bots, the flight and accommodation must be booked together or none of them. And in the legacy world or with the monolithic uh, application, you might not be aware of this problem as the coordination between these modules is done within a single process and a single transactional context. In the distributed world, this requires a different approach. So Saga pattern offers a solution to this problem. And it does that by splitting up one such an overarching business transaction into a series of local database transactions that are executed by each service. And uh, in general, there are two ways for implementing uh, sagas, uh, choreography and orchestration. In the choreography approach, uh, one participating service uh, sends a message to the next service after it has executed this local transaction. So the overall, uh, or orchestration logic is spread among all the participating services. With the choreography approach, there is uh, uh, one central coordinating service that coordinates and invokes the participating services. Uh, and as for the communication between the participating services, it can be either synchronously with things such as HTTP, gRPC, or it can be asynchronously via messaging such as Apache Kafka. And the reason I'm mentioning this pattern here briefly is that uh, uh, you can implement Saga pattern using the Pizium, Apache Kafka, and Outbox pattern. And with these tools, it is possible uh, to get advantage of the orchestration approach uh, and have one place, one central place that 
manages the flow of the whole saga in one place where you can go and check the status of the saga. Um, and at the same time, you can com combine the orchestration approach with asynchronous communication approach. So that decouples the coordination ser uh, the coordinating service from the availability of the participating services. Um, so that gives you kind of the best of both worlds, orchestration and asynchronous communication with participating services. And this is, uh, in my view, an awesome event-driven implementation option for long-running business transactions use case. Uh, you can check the blog I've shared uh, on the slides uh, uh, for a detailed uh, write-up and an example how to implement uh, sagas with the Bizium and Outbox pattern. It's very elegant. Uh, this takes us to the summary. So, um, Strangler pattern and Outbox pattern, uh, Tiger pattern, this can help you migrate, you know, from brownfield systems, but at the same time, they can help you create, you know, greenfield event-driven services that are future-proof. And projects such as Kubernetes, Kafka, Divisium, these are open source projects that have become, you know, de facto standards in their respective fields. Using them will help you create solutions that have rich uh, ecosystem of tools and uh, best practices and community. And the last takeaway from this talk for me is the kind of the realization that modern systems, uh, they're like cities, you know, they evolve over time on top of legacy systems and proven uh, and using proven patterns and standardized tools will uh, help you create systems that last uh, longer. Uh, lastly, uh, here are a few of the resources uh, to the topics I covered today and I got uh, inspired from and I used in this talk. You know, check out these books and the projects uh, which are all related to application modernization and event-driven architecture and Kubernetes. Um, I've mentioned um, at the beginning, I'm now working on uh, Kafka. So uh, there is, a, this is one of our first services at Red Hat. Uh, it's a fully managed Apache Kafka service. So you can give it a try in a few seconds and you can give us feedback if you want to. Uh, thank you, that's all I got. And I believe we have also some time for questions. Thank you so much, Bilgin. That was an awesome presentation. So yeah, we definitely have a, a couple of questions. So I'll start off um, with the first one that we got. This was whenever you're going over the strangler method. Um, so in the strangler method, how can the old application subset be taken as services? Okay, I think this goes back to uh, uh, identifying, if, if I get the question right, identifying um, what are the uh, the boundaries of uh, what, what are the aggregates? What's the uh, uh, what are the boundary boundaries of the applications you want to uh, extract and potentially they become a boundary for your microservice? And the two methods which are kind of related is uh, which I said in slides is use domain driven design or uh, the event storming technique from Antonio Brandolini. This kind of help you identify, you know, from business functionality point of view, what are the uh, what, what are the different uh, subdomains within your application. So I, I would say initially you you need somebody who knows the legacy application, um, and uh, you you need somebody who knows um, about domain driven design, event storming, and spend a couple of days, you know, um, at least to kick off the, uh, this activity and trying to understand what are the different uh, uh, entities you can migrate. But I'm not sure if I got the question right, uh, to be honest. It is I, I, I think so. I think that, um, that's where they're getting at. But if for some reason that doesn't uh, answer your question, please feel free to put it in the chat. And in the, in the meantime, the second question we got is, how do you ensure all logs from different databases are written in same formats? Um, so it, here it depends whether we're talking about um, different databases, like different uh, types of databases, MySQL, Postgres, or there are different 
instances of the same database. Um, but uh, so the BZUM can read uh, transaction log files from a number of databases uh, right now. And uh, what it what it does is it exactly knows what's the uh, log format, and it also it's not emitting raw events. It transformed those to, into single change format where you can see what was the stage uh, state of the data before an update, what was the state after an update, what was the operation, you know, which database and what tables have changed. So what you get out of that is one unified uh, abstract representation. Uh, so on the consumer side, you are not concerned with where the data come from, what type of database. But not only that, it can also, in some cases, uh, for example, in case of Oracle database, it has smarts, the connector has some smarts to correlate multiple change events into a single, into a single event uh, to emit. Uh, so on the consumer side, you are really not worried about the source database type. You're consuming events uh, which are defined by the the BZUM uh, specification. Okay, thank you. And thank you, Eric D'Andrea, for putting an answers to that as well. So uh, the third question is, how would rollbacks be handled in the outback, in the outbox pattern? Uh, okay, I'm, I'm guessing that's a, a rollback that happens um, uh, in the source database when we are using outbox patterns. So the beauty there is that from the application side, you are doing a single local transaction. So the application is only writing to its own database, which in addition to its tables that are needed for the business logic also has additional table uh, that's called outbox where you write what needs to be emitted. So that's committed in a single transaction. That transaction is either committed or rolled back. Uh, uh, and Divisium is reading the transaction log. So if it's rolled back, it won't be in the transaction log. It won't be emitted at all. That said, there are some differences between different databases. Again, the Oracle one is particularly painful because the transaction log actually has transaction events which are not which can be also rolled back, not committed, but the, the whole complexity of rollback transactions, even in that case, is handled by the Debezium connector. So you as a consumer of events from Kafka, you will not get events that are part of rollback transaction. And uh, Debezium has the smarts to skip and not send those in case of Oracle. In other cases, it, they won't be there at all. Okay, that Suresh, the question. I, I think so. Suresh, uh, if, if you still need a little bit more clarity, feel free to put it in the chat. Um, and then the next question is, how do we handle legacy applications like AS400 or mainframe? Okay, mm, so, um, the, uh, yeah, this, <laughs> this is a, a particularly hard one, but, uh, at some point, I spoke about Apache Camel and the fact that it has hundreds of connectors. Uh, and um, I have to say that it also has connectors for, I think it's 400, so even has some connectors for mainframe. I mean, that, that's, uh, that's uh, one thing. Uh, uh, one, uh, you, if that helps, uh, another approach would be with something like uh, the Bizium, maybe you are, you are not in a position in any way to intercept calls to that mainframe application or to touch its storage, I don't know even what's that. Uh, but maybe with something like the Bizium, you can just, uh, you know, attack the application from, uh, from the transaction log side and just send the, uh, send the events. Um, so there is one book in my slide, which I refer to, which is Monolith to Microservices by Simon Newman. So that's the most advanced book I'm aware of for uh, migration. And there are lots of different techniques that you can use. Maybe you can apply something from uh, from there, but it all depends what kind of constraints the mainframe poses on you. Okay, awesome. Um, so it looks like those are all the questions, Bill. 
So everyone, I will put um, the recording and the slides, I'll send them out in an email to the conveyor email list, and I'll also post them in the LinkedIn event registration page. Um, so if you're not on one of those, um, just feel free to reach out to me at jracinos at redhat.com, and I'll make sure you, you'll get the, the slides and the recording. And Bill Ginn, thank you so much for, for presenting. I think everyone got a lot out of this, so we'll see you next time. Th thanks for having me. It was a pleasure. And if you have any questions, comments, please hit me on Twitter. Thanks a lot. Bye, everyone.